thoughts and friends to our PCS IDS seminar today. We have a pleasure of hosting Ms. Lara Kohler from University Paris Saclay in France. And our scientific host today is Sergei, who will introduce Lara. Yeah, welcome everyone. Uh, so uh, today we have a, uh, a seminar which is a bit on a different topic than our usual ones, which I think is quite good for us. We should not be too much focused on our own, our own little world and look outside. Um, how did it come about? Uh, Lara approached us a couple of, I think, months ago, first time, uh, being in the job for other reasons, uh, whether she can spend also some time at the uh, center and uh, looking at the background, I thought, well, why not? Um, her main uh, expertise is in biophysics, theoretical biophysics, so I guess we may have something to discuss about here at the center. And uh, then this repeated uh, now again, and uh, in principle there are maybe there's a, a nice IBS center in, where is it, in, in Ulsan, I think, but that's very far away, and for other reasons, uh, Lara decided to stay with what happens here. Okay, let me continue. I hope it still works to stay with us, which is great. And um, so, and uh, but during the second visit, I, we discussed and thought it's a good idea if she does a talk about her current uh, uh, PhD work so that we know a bit better uh, what uh, uh, she's working on, and so maybe there are even at the end of the day, some uh, uh, some interactions on that uh, on that ground on these grounds. So let me just uh, say a few more words. Uh, Lara did her master at the uh, university in Paris Saclay in uh, 2019, and uh, then she basically she had a few other small activities like being a visiting graduate student at the LMU in Munich. Uh, but then she continued since 2020 to be a graduate student in, in theoretical biophysics, again in the Lenz group at the University of Paris Saclay. And uh, she has published uh, a couple of uh, interesting uh, looking publications. She has expertise in uh, theory and experiments, if I understand correctly. Uh, but uh, what is also very interesting, maybe not very much related to our today's uh, presentation here, is that she uh, also uh, is a cons or was a consultant on public policy for the French Ministry for Agriculture and Food in Paris, which I find quite nice for a young person like you. So today we will listen uh, more on principles of self-assembly for particles with simple geometries and complex interactions. So the floor is yours, Lara. Thank you. Thank Please welcome much. the speaker. Yeah, thank you very much for having me in January and again this time. And so I'm going to tell you about uh, most of my PhD work that is ending very soon. So this is kind of almost the full story now. And please interrupt me anytime if you have questions, of course. So I'm going to tell you a lot about self-assembly today. And uh, here is, let me just start by telling the big ideas behind self-assembly. So what we typically do is that we have particles they come together just because of their interactions and not because someone put them there and then the shape of the assembly is going to be controlled very much by the local interactions so here uh, it's a highly idealized particle with a polar and a hydrophobic part in green and red and this is some uh, experimental paper so what they do is that they just um, they will just change the polarity of the solvents and by doing this, they will increase the strength of the polar interaction of the particle. So at first, it forms these little micelles because there's basically no polar interactions and just the hydrophobic parts come together. But then they increase the polar interaction and uh, you will see those types of fibrils starting forming. And then if you increase it even further, you have a bundling of those fibers and you observe an aggregate on a much larger length scale. So what you change here is uh, the solvent problem, right? Uh, yes. Exactly. Who are kind of like trying try to, to drag them. these things apart from each other. Sorry? Who are trying to drag these uh, these uh, particles uh, apart from each other. So, you have the star picture there when they all... Yes. And now the solvent tries to push them away from each other, right? Um, I wouldn't say this. I think at the, at the beginning, yes, because there is only the red interaction that matter, but then as you increase the polarity of the solvent, then the polar parts of the particle 
start also like sticking to one another, and that's that's what leads to that chain. Okay. Can you please give some brief uh, brief details of the experiment? Just what is the, what is molecular so it's, the it's, uh, the Yes. So. I mean, this is just an introductory example, and I'm going to tell much more about my work later. But uh, so this is an example of this paper, and basically they have a, a very large molecule uh, that um, I mean it has many uh, cycles, like uh, uh, cycles of, of carbons, and I mean I don't I I we can look together to the paper precisely. It's mostly illustrative, but the thing is this. Uh, way of representing the particle is super, super uh, schematic. And the goal is just to say, there's two types of interactions that are on the same particle. And then by changing some external parameter, you will vary those interactions. No, sure, this, this is fine probably, but still, uh, let's see, what, what means increased polar interactions? How do, how do they do that? Uh, yeah, do we have to change the chemistry of the solvent? Or? Yes, I think basically they would add some. I, I, I have to confess, I, okay. I don't know the detail, but they would have some salt or some salt. Fair enough. Yes. Uh, so, chemical, what does it mean to be hydrophobic? What's the chemical mechanism of action of being hydrophobic? Uh, that you prefer, like you have a, in, like a higher affinity with uh, yourself than with the solvent, basically? An example of this is uh, are the soaps, right? The soap yes. work in that way, right? Yes. You can, you can think of it, yeah, you could you could think of it as like you know the this um, uh, soap molecules that have very long like hydrophobic tails. Basically, it's just that it's um, it has a long carbon chain and it's not really has, doesn't have a good affinity with the water. And then there is the the polar part that has more affinity with the water because it can exchange ions with it. Uh -huh. Something like this. So when we wash our hands and we are in the first configuration, right? Yes, that's okay. Wait, first out of these three or uh yes. Because essentially water is doesn't introduce polar interaction, so you stay in the first. Yes. And so we cannot wash our hands with the second one? <laughs> Maybe you can. I mean, I think this molecule, I, I, I can later show you the, the real, like what these molecules really look like, and I'm not even sure it's a good idea to like put it next to your skin. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Today, I'm not going to tell you more about this, like, uh, or, organic molecules, but rather about proteins, because proteins also self assemble. And so here it's an example of the protein that is called alpha semiclein, and it's involved in uh, Parkinson's disease. And um, typically what happens is that there is a misfolding of that protein, and then it will start aggregating in either those oligomers that you saw first, or this very long fibrillar structures. Yes. So, so I wonder if you could give us some context of self-assembly. So, so I know about self-assembly, let's say, when uh, leaves are self self assemble, they, they go to a certain shape based on the DNA, right? Or, or our gut. They are leaves like three leaves. Yes. Could you maybe say a bit more where, in, in, when, where do we see self assembly? Well, and in proteins, for right, example. Yeah, but maybe like a bit more so I can okay, see like so what's the big picture and the smaller so, picture. So I, I would say big picture is pretty much that one. Like, Proteins are individual subunits, like uh -huh. this one or that one here or the yellow one there. And because the surface of a protein is full of amino acids that have uh, either electrostatic or hydrophobic or uh, uh, chemical uh, interaction with uh, copies of the same subunit somewhere else, mm -hmm. uh, you will start by having everything in solution and then just by a mechanism of like decreasing the energy of the whole system, it's going to be more stable to bind the individual units than to take them, like to keep them separate. And for this reason, there's going to be an, what I call an assembly or an aggregate. It's just like all the subunits have come together and now they form a shape. And these complex structures like humans are as also this. Um, so, no, okay. What, what is very important here is uh, thermal noise. Like uh, what you need is that your components are like basically free to wiggle around, and uh -huh. then at some because of uh, thermal agitation, they will at some point be next to one another. And then if this is energetic favor, they're going to stay together. But 
like this also is a very idealized image and what happens basically in the cell is that it's always fluctuating but it's more fluctuating in one direction than the other and so it's in the end the result is going to be this. but you really have to keep in mind that this is all the time uh, giggling because of some noise so to see self assembly i need some property like let's say hydrophobic or something you need interactions whatever it means it can be again hydrophobic it can be electrostatic it can be and polar plus the thermal noise yes and if you have interaction and thermal noise you will always get self-assembly well this i'm going to tell you more about ah, okay. Okay. Yeah, if you ever get there yes if i ever get there okay <laughs> so and um maybe what i want to focus with those examples of proteins here is that the shapes the results of the self assembly can be very different. Here you have the fibers that are like very elongated objects that are not limited in size, but you have those oligomers of only a few particles. Here you have the, so this is the capsid of a virus. So typically the DNA material of a virus is uh, uh, encompassed in this kind of capsid. And here, like it's a very well organized structure. And here, for example, it's something uh, that forms in the proteins of milk. And here the size of this aggregate is, is finite, but the organization of the proteins within is not super well organized like this example. So this is just to illustrate the diversity of the shapes that can occur. So you would say, okay, so maybe I just need like one very sticky interaction in that region that will stick to that other one. And then I'm always gonna form this specific shape. But the thing is it appears in proteins that it's a bit more complicated than this. Um, and for this, I'm going to give you two examples. Uh, here it's a protein. Don't worry, I, I'm talking about protein now, but I'm going to talk about theory later. Um, so here it's a, a protein in the uh, cell. Usually it won't aggregate. So here it's an example where it doesn't aggregate. There's no interactions so that it's going to form an like one single aggregate. And you see this because the fluorescent signal is all over the droplets. But now you make one single mutation on one single amino acid at the surface of that protein, and it will form this very elongated fibrillar structure. So, so the various proteins aggregate that to form. Yes, just because of one mutation. But in all of them. Sorry? In all of them. Yes, yes. Um, and so this uh, is an illustration that maybe the, uh, the result of the self-assembly is not completely trivial and there's maybe like several local minimum that are competing and a slight change in the interaction is going to lead to the one result or the other of the self assembly and another example so this is in vitro and another example of this in vivo is this protein that is involved in some biological process that i'm not going to detail uh, it has this shape but it can switch between one organization or the other so just the tetramer or a fiber of tetramer in the Sorry, but, yeah, yes. keep, 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 keep. what you call protein is the small piece uh, or the the fine or, or the no, final so shape? That, that's the protein that's the aggregate that's it that's ah, how okay. I call this. okay uh but here what's cool is that so the cell can be in like the proteins in the cell can be this in this configuration or that configuration depending on what it has to do and this is for the eukaryote organism so this protein will lead to that filament but then in the prokaryote organism it will lead to a fiber that has a slightly different organization. In that case, the, the tetramers are packaged like this, and in that case, the tetramers are packaged like this. And so this is another example to illustrate that currently there is sticky spots here and here on the surface of the protein. And depending on very subtle details, it's gonna form this filament or this filament. So what is so special about proteins in their ability to be they, so sensitive in self-assembly? They, I mean, they are very complex. That's that the so a protein is a long chain of amino acid that is folded in 3D, and then all around its surface there are plenty of uh, like first the the shape is a bit uh, it can be a bit messy, and then there's like spots all around that can interact in like an infinite number of ways. Yes. Uh, I know it's not. It's it's a fluorescence. It's just like you mark some protein with some fluorescent uh, other molecule and you bind them two together, and then you can observe. So the it's a microscope. Yes. 
so what's the size? I don't know. Sorry. I can I can I can add the you're you're right. Thank you for letting me know I I add the uh, scale, but I mean I, I okay I I would don't want to say something. But what's the size of an individual? Ah uh, it's like a few nanometers. Right. So then maybe yes. you have hundreds here, yes. so okay. yes. you get yeah. So what is an example of thing that doesn't well assemble? Well, there is proteins, I can give you names if you want, like pepsin, for example, is a, is a protein that doesn't aggregate with any other. And like that's uh, because it's, you can think of something that is mostly repulsive and it's never going to bind to a neighbor because it's uh, repulsive. Oh, so it's a combination of like being attractive and some parts that are positive, the other which makes it default. Ah, okay, I'm starting to get it. Okay. And, uh, yes. Can you say these different uh, these different processes of the puzzle to so different proteins which have formed one filament? Yeah. They are they all absolutely identical to each other, or are there slight? Uh, so, uh, in the frame of my work, I mostly considered only I completely identical objects, and typically that's what happens in the cells. Like all the proteins are copies, like, copies of one another. Then what also can happen is that there's aggregates of several types of proteins together, which goes a bit further from what I did, but like for example in the virus example, in plenty of examples, it's just one copy of always the same. And it's not somehow uh, spoiled by other things which are swimming around in the cell? Or... I mean, if one is spoiled, all the other are spoiled the same way and, uh, and then it's just a difference. So it's complex but identical units. Yes. Okay. Okay, and so what typically people have uh, introduced to deal with this kind of question is something that is called patchy particles. So here it's results of um, of uh, molecular dynamic simulations uh, from the paper that first introduced this kind of model. And basically you have a, a sphere and you put sticky patches on the surface of the sphere. And depending on where you put the patches and how they are uh, spread all around the sphere, it's going to give either here it's a, a sheet of, of beads and here it's a micelles of only a few beads. So those models are, are very convenient to have illustrative examples like, okay, look, you put those patches here, then it's going to result in that self assembly. But um, it's not, um, it doesn't provide a systematic understanding of the relation between. The local interactions and the shape of the aggregate, just because there are so many things that you can vary. You can vary the, the position, the size, the strength, the number of the batches, their specificity, meaning do they stick to, like, do the red batch stick to the red batch or to the blue batch, uh, and the strength of the interaction. So, all of this is kind of hard to compare with, with one another. And then you couldn't build such thing that as a phase diagram that would say, okay, in this region of the parameters. This there is this shape, and in this other region, there is that shape. And in this model, how to treat in the water molecule? Sorry? How to treat in the water molecule? How, how can I treat the water molecule? With in, this? In, in. I mean, you. Water molecule is very important for that. Maybe a, what's a bit different, the. the uh, no, not even. Like, so you want to have many water molecules, and then you want to see what happens. So, OK, maybe a, an interesting uh, comment compared to your question is that here I'm in a very dilute environment. Mm -hmm. Like I have few particles spread all around, and then they will aggregate because of uh, interactions rather than because of density. In this model, is it included the water or? Um, or so no, it's it I mean, ah, so, so OK, now I understand your question, sorry. So no, typically it's. Uh, they, they don't explicitly model the water molecules. They just model the thermal noise, and the thermal noise uh, is actually resulting from the like the like time interaction with the, the if, water molecules. If I'm correct, uh, it is uh, just to search for longevity dynamics. For what, sorry? Longevity dynamics, so it accounts yes, for, yes, exactly. uh, for, uh, for heating by water molecules, and also for some dissipation due to viscosity of water. So this. So at least uh, this is one of possible ways yes. of in dynamics. And also, just now I have also a question, what types of interactions, I mean long range or short range, are uh, modeled in such situations yeah. between the red spots? So typically here it's short range. Oh. And, and in the rest, I'm also going to only consider short range. 
Okay. Um, another uh, inconvenient of those patch particles model is that basically whenever you have a, a patch on interaction, you it's always possible to realize it, like to have this uh, interaction actually happen. And in the examples of the protein that I showed you before, it seemed that there were like plenty of different possible ways that the protein could interact that were in competition. That is not the case here. And let me just give you one more example of why is this important. Um, by telling you about uh, geometric frustration, that is something very much broader than uh, biophysics, but I'm going to tell you what I uh, care about it in my specific uh, case. And I'm just going to illustrate this with uh, this example of uh, nematic particles. So nematic particles, they are asymmetric and they have specific interactions. So typically here, what they want is have a slight twist with the neighboring particles. That's their most, most favored um, um, arrangements, let's say. So here uh, I have those uh, nematic particles. The, this one is straight. And then the more you go to the left, the more they're bent. Okay, now if you want to um, actually pack the, oh, sorry, try this again. So if you want to pack the, the, the plane with this, you can, for example, like have this twist all around this cylindrical organization. But the thing is, you can't grow this cylindrical organization more because then it's there's going to start having a repulsive interaction between those two. So you, you start packing your, your particles, but then you have to stop at some point. And then what happened is something very, I think, fancy, is that you have those cylinders of particles, and then they arrange with uh, each other in some kind of, um, uh, okay, it's coming, yes, um, lattice that is like super well organized. And that's actually, so the blue phase of liquid crystal that is involved in the uh, uh, blue, blue ray technology, if I uh, know correctly. And uh, what is interesting is that there is those disclinations here. So there's regions of the organization that are, that are highly energetic and the particles don't want to be packed like this. But because the whole structure is the most stable, they, the, the particles actually pay the cost for these very highly energetic disclinations in some regions of the um, of, of the organization. So uh, here, my message is um, because of frustration, that is, you can't have the most preferred organization everywhere because of geometric constraints. Some very like unusual and non-trivial special patterns of your particles can arise. And that's why uh, we uh, started the whole project by thinking, okay, it's important to consider geometric frustration. And now we're going to try to implement it in, a, in our models of self assembly So I think it was frustration in this context. So here, what I want to call frustration is the fact that there is this uh, double twist cylinder organization of the particle. But you can't have it everywhere. Like at some point, if you start packing your particles like this, there's going to be a moment where you can't add extra particles to this double cylinder because then it, it has the wrong interactions with the, with the neighbors. So it's like there's several, um, like the most local arrangements of the particle can't be uh, everywhere for every part, can't be realized for all the particles. Yes, I don't understand. Like, the, why does the frustration, the, the word frustration, does it count? Like, uh, uh, you mean compared to? It's a semantic thing. Yeah. yeah. So, I spin. so another very very basic example of frustration is yeah. an anisotropic. Um, sorry, uh, antiferromagnetic spin system on a triangular lattice. Yeah. Okay, you, what you want is to be unaligned with your neighbor. If you have a triangle on the tri on the triangular lattice, so three sides that are neighbors, you put the first one like this, the second one like this, and there you don't know what to put. So because the first, the third one is frustrating. Yeah. Yes. yes, I mean, no, you, you say that, that there is frustration. Oh, I see. It that. wants to go, but you can go do it once. Yeah. Ah, I see. Let me give you an example. So again, it's a very simple example, probably a bit close, but this is think of packing oranges. Uh -huh. So what we know is FCC is locally, it's the local packing system, which I put a lot of work is that the range of FCC, but actually 
you start going to take one orange and then say, okay, now I'll try to pack oranges as called as possible. Uh, there's an eco set of, I think, it gives locally that's fine, but you cannot, but you cannot tile the entire space. Like that. It says symmetry five, which you know, you cannot implement in three dimensions. It doesn't work. At some point, you, you, will, uh, you will start trying to get holes or you won't be able to continue. So there are spaces like a global like that way. cannot be generalized to infinite. Exactly. Frustration means that at some point you fail to satisfy, like some, some interactions will be unsatisfied because there's no way to do it. Uh, has to be okay, okay, I'm, I'm getting more now. It's also collective, which the, one of them sacrifice and go to the unwanted situation. Don't worry about how you try, there's always someone who's unhappy. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, yes. So, so, I'll just picture some question. Maybe you could comment in a little more detail. Because in magnetic systems, when you have, when you have frustration, you can, for example, Arrange a Skirmionic configuration and you will get a Skirmionic tube. But you know, you can have uh, one Skirmionic tube for your sample and it's, it is okay. Why here I need these tubes in different directions? What is, it, what is the fundamental difference in this part? Um, I'm so okay. This happened only in a very specific temperature range of the pneumatic particles. It has been like proved experimentally if that is of any help of this like very highly against schematic uh, picture. I'm not sure how this compares to the skirmionic. I think the, the particles here are non-magnetic. Uh, they, they just have those interactions that makes them want to have a slight twist because they are, uh, um, uh, I mean, they have some some polarity and some interactions, but so I I don't know exactly with wow. I mean this is like one example of one type of particles that have this specific interaction and is gonna so maybe the specific. first from some long range interaction. Oh, no, 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 I think in your skirmion picture your your spins are nailed, right? You can just turn around. Here they can move around in free space. Ah, yes, yes, yes. But also, also on gauge interaction, which tells you if you allow your spins in your skirmion system to move around, you will lose your skirmion movement. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I guess that would be nice. I understand now. Okay. And so, the question that's so after this long introduction, the question that I'm tackling in, in my work is. Uh, what are the features of the local interactions between the particles? So here, for example, the features of the local interactions are there is this interaction between that part and that part, and then this one with this one and this one. And okay, so this one could stick to either that one or that one. So which one are we going to choose? Like all these types of questions of like the complexity of the local interactions, how all of this is related to the shape of the aggregate. And when I say shape, I say is it going to be a large infinite uh, aggregate or is it going to be fibrillar or like small sized aggregates? So that's going to be my first question. And the second is how, what is the role of geometric frustration in this specific example? Um, and so for this, uh, the program is this one. I'm not going to go through all of this, but uh, let's say maybe today I can just uh, introduce you the minimal model and tell you a bit about uh, the statistical results that we obtain and that we uh, manage to classify with machine learning. And maybe if I have time I, or later, we can talk about real space renormalization that we also use to uh, tackle the specific model that I introduced. But OK, let me just tell you about this uh, very simplistic model of self-assembly that tries to answer the questions that I, I raised in the introduction. So, the model of Luxembourg is lattice particles uh, that have uh, that are anisotropic, so they have six faces. And what you want is to define an interaction between each pair of faces of the particle. And you, what we will just do is assign a binding energy to a pair of faces. So in the previous case, I told you, okay, there can be patches, there can be electrostatic interactions, there can be shape complementary to many different types of interactions, and I don't want to care about those details. What I just want to define is a binding energy that tells me how, whatever the process, this is favored and this is not. So there's six uh, times six pairs of faces that I can consider. So this is going to be my interaction matrix or interaction map where I have to consider all the pair of faces. 
just because of the very uh, by basic symmetry of the system, there's only 21 out of those 36 interactions that are going to matter. Is it the same to the triple material? No. Uh, we, sorry, which? Pots. Ah, pots. So, no, this, thank you for asking the question. This is not a POTS model because in the POTS model, what matters is the uh, relative orientations of the two spins. And here, what matters is the phase that are in contact. So in that case, if I am, if I am like this or like this, I'm not going to have at all the same orientation because not the same phases of my particles are in contact. But if you look at the spins, it's going to be like this or like this, and then the cosine is just going to be the same. So this cannot be mapped to a POTS model. And also the difference is that I'm in a dilute environment, so I can either have a particle with a specific orientation or no particle. Is that a, I mean, two uh, six because of I mean, for um, choose five. No, you could. Yeah, we could have chosen four. And What's convenient is that here, um, and I'm gonna. Okay, can I answer to this question in one yeah. slide, please? Okay, um, and yeah, this is 2D model. completely 2D model, that is model, very, very simplistic. And then, so the... Do you have a, sorry, just, do you have a, a notion of field infraction, like how many particles you... So I will fix the number of particles okay. in, the, in the box. And what I, how I can count the energy is just I count how many pair of each face are actually in contact and how much do they cost. Can we have the empty itself? Yes. Yes. Okay. And so maybe let's let's start with this. So what I do is I run numerical simulations. Uh, I start with particles everywhere. So this is the initial uh, before equilibration. I start with particle having random positions and orientation in a, a, a lattice of fixed size with a fixed number of particle, and then I choose an interaction map. So here and over there, it's the most simple interaction maps where basically. It's just an uh, isotropic particle that you're very used to. And sorry, the color. So here, the indices of the matrix are the one that I showed just before. And the colors are, if it's blue, it's favored. If it's white, it's neutral. So blue means favored interaction. And okay. black and disfavored. Uh, no, that's a uh, dark blue. Oh, sorry. sorry. That's, that's, dark. that's dark blue. I so think, this is okay. highly favored. So there is no disfavor in the situation. So far, no. Okay. By position, this is discrete model with some lattice, or this is continuous model. For no, the this discrete. It, they, they live on the lattice, and so they can only need the particles. And so what I do is I run Monte Carlo simulations, and at each step, the particle can either turn or go somewhere else. I'm, and I'm looking for the stable state at finite temperature. And so maybe let me just run like look what happened when I run the, the simulation and I equilibrate the system. But there is no kinetic energy or no. no? Like I just, I'm what I do is I do simulated annealing. So I start at high temperature and I decrease it just to be sure that mm -hmm. I'm finding the equilibrium configuration, but there, I'm not considering kinetics. And what was again the difference between the different? Uh, well, do you still have the matrices here. Um, these are the matrix elements. Yes, these are the interaction matrix. Okay. So uh, here already those uh, eight examples show that depending on how you choose the favored interactions, you can really have the result of the cell assembly that is extremely different. And, and sorry, and, and, and the no to, to the POTS model is because, so to say the POTS model would be, the spin would be just how you orient one of them, right? And then you have a second one, correct? Mm -hmm. so, so that will be like a spin. The yes. second one will have another spin, but now it depends uh, yes. on which side the both. So yes. it's again this freedom in the uh, this freedom to roam around in space, which, which you usually don't have in all these uh, magnetic uh, models, which, yes, exactly. because you pin spins. Like that, exactly. But what is the relation between these like matrix elements and the visually what we see? So uh, typically here, if I would count, uh, like okay, I have this interaction and I count how many times it occurs in the system. I would have a like super simplistic relation, like the one that are favored are the one that I observe. But this is some very specific example, and maybe now I can tell you about a bit less trivial. Yeah. So okay. this is true. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So this is like a two D structure, but I don't get what that, why there are so many elements. Uh, you mean elements in elements of the matrix? Yeah. I mean, I have particles with six faces. I have to define an energy for each pair of face. 
And here it appears trivial again, but then oh, it's, it's six because it's like six sides, and yes. every side has a set. Then I mean, it's so a, it's really like a particle is this guy here, uh -huh. and it has six faces that I just color in different colors. Yeah. And then I, I'm looking at what's the energy of yellow interacting with blue. Uh, okay, I got it. Well, that's a question. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yes. It looks, I mean, maybe I, I was wrong, but it looks when you when you see the simulation that the let me call thermal the equilibration time are very different from each other. Is it relevant um, for you or not? I mean, I it will actually depend on, so what I do is I do a temperature ramp, like I start at high temperature and I decrease it linearly. And so that was not the time evolution. No, that was the uh, like, uh, 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 I see, okay. So okay. okay, okay. So, so depending no, no. on the okay. typical strengths of the simulation, the okay. transition is gonna happen. Okay, so maybe a follow up question, in that oligomer, yes. if I look at the matrix, it just means that the one side highly interacts with the third side, but not with itself, and that's yes, all. Exactly. Ah, yeah. Okay, I got it. Okay. So now you think it's all very basic. I think I just oh, yeah, also about the scriptures. Yes, crystallite, in my opinion, is uh, something like crystal, but a small size. Yes. yes. But if, if you vary your concentration, maybe crystal and crystalline are quite the same, no? Um, that, yeah, that's that's a good point. So the thing is here, the between the crystal and the crystallite, uh, here the uh, energy, uh, interaction energy is, is such that you can have particles that are not completely crystallized. It's kind of at the limit of the transition, if you if you want. Which makes that which uh, as a result the, the structure is not completely equilibrated. But if you would go to so here I'm at finite temperature. If you would go to zero temperature, the stuff would aggregate. So yes. I would like to certify my comprehension. So you you are showing the movies. And uh, each frame of the movie was corresponding to some temperature, even temperature. Yes. So is the is the yeah related because I also say so let's say each frame, as you say, is uh, the equilibrium position so at the temperature. I yes, what I, what I can tell you is the parameter of the simulation. I have the one hundred temperature from like if this is minus ten kT, then I have I start from ten. Uh, like mm -hmm. KBT equals 10 and I... And I for each of them, five. you check the ground state. And right? for each of them, I mean, it's not it's a ground state in, in the sense that the temperature is finite, but it's the equilibrium states. And I run okay. like... So, so you, yeah. Okay. And I run like... And at which extent the equilibrium states are different for various grounds? Uh, 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 they are the same. I mean, so the exact configuration of the system is not is not going to be completely the same. Like maybe here that guy is going to be there, but uh, if you, for example, if you count, uh, you remember the end, like how many spaces are in contact from different uh, run of the same simulation with the same interaction map, you have the same. And when you, because you were talking about noise, the player or the noise in this case is at the thermal. Uh, yes. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Well, my other uh, question: uh, Haven't you observed some mixed configurations here? Yes. Very some rarely. Very, very. I mean, you have to be at a very specific point of your parameter space where you're in between two most stable interactions. But I'm going to tell you something. Show you something just after that is actually going in the different opposite direction. So um, I told you I have my interaction map. Now I can choose it much more randomly than I did so far. I just choose every interaction energy uh, arbitrarily with uh, some continuous scale. So my energy scale is here. And now I can, so first maybe I can look at for the naive result of the equilibration and say, I don't run a simulation, I just minimize uh, the energy by choosing the, the, so the density here is how many faces I have of each that brings the most stable energy. And I ha just have to respect some constraint that the number of particles is fixed. So here, for example, if I have, if I do this very simplistic minimization, that's the result of what I expect for this interaction map. But now let's look a bit closer to it. So here, I just put back the coordinates again. So I first uh, know that I should have a lot of this interaction. 
So this interaction is the blue with the purple. It's this one. It's very favored. I have a lot of it. Great. Now I have this other one, the purple next to the purple. So I try to achieve it as well. It's very favored. I have a lot of it. Cool. But what is not taken into account in this naive minimization is that if I have a lot of those two, then I also have a lot of that one. And that one is uh, energetic favored. And that's, in a sense, uh, how I see geometric frustration in this specific model, that uh, this actually, if you just naively minimize the energies uh, locally, you don't, you don't get the most stable state uh, that is possible with the geometry of the particles. And so instead of having this matrix, if I run the simulation, I measure that density and I have that organization. And what I can do is quantify the frustration in my system by just comparing the energy of a, a needleized system with this configuration and the energy of my system. And here, the relative uh, energy difference is 30%. So that's a way for me to quantify the frustration. And among the three best uh, energies, you choose the one that. Uh... Are compatible. Exactly. Yes. And you were saying, okay, so maybe I have two configurations at the uh, at the same time in the same system. Now let me show you two examples where I have so the one that you know and another interaction map that is extremely similar. I'm just tuning a few energies, and both are the results of the self-assembly. So I never have a mixture of both, uh, but some very uh, Subtle changes in the interactions have very uh, plastic results in the in the equilibrium self assembly. And so, with this model, I'm kind of in the frame that I wanted to have at the beginning. That I I have those proteins that a very small change in the interaction is going to have drastic consequences on the, on the assembly. Okay. Um, so. That was for frustration, but now I can, what I can do is try to explore a bit more of this, and I'm going to stop very soon. Explore uh, this 21 dimensional parameter because that's what I want to do. I want to relate interactions and shape. And so, what I do is, of course, I can't explore it uh, exhaustively uh, in this 21 dimension, but what I do is I will draw random interaction maps that have a given uh, 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 average and uh, standard deviation. And I want to think of those parameters as the affinity of the particle. So if it's all overall attract, um, like the energies are overall negative, the particle is attractive. And if they are overall positive, the uh, particle is repulsive. And then I have the anisotropy of the particle is how much uh, different the particles are to one another. And uh, and of course, like the very, the isotropic case, we we know all about it. So the question is. What happens if you increase anisotropy? And so now I will draw uh, lots of different random interactions for fixed uh, parameter of affinity and anisotropy, and I look at what's the result of the self assembly. And that's some examples. So typically, I I draw two hundred per conditions of affinity and anisotropy, and here I just show you some. And uh, so if you look at the most lower line of the of this table. Sorry, Amos, what do you mean by random interactions? Uh, sorry, yes. I draw each uh, uh, interaction in this matrix as in a Gaussian distribution with a fixed uh, average and some okay, So you have one realization, I, and then you run it. Yes. And then you take another realization, you get something. Yes. But isn't that more or less what we have seen before? You take different matrices yes, and you get different. Yes, but now I want to like relate both. Oh. Yes. So here I'm again just showing an example, but a bit more complex than the one that I had before because here I can't trivially re like I cannot trivially predict the result of the self assembly. But each example is for one realization. Yes. Oh. But now you can just imagine there's two hundred of them per sure. square that I uh, I'm not showing you because it's not the purpose. So okay, uh, what is interesting here maybe is just that. Um, you, if you want to look at the fibers, for example, uh, they are very different from one another. So here I show you examples of four fibers. Some have with two, some have with one, some have like alternating alternating orientation of the particles. Some have all the particles aligned, and still this is all of this is still a fiber. And so there is this 
um, uh, trade-off between, okay, what I characterize as the macroscopic shape and then the local details of the organization. And here from, from what we see, typically the, the macroscopic organization are quite similar, but the local details will vary a lot. And then what I do is that I classify those aggregates in the eight categories that I've introduced to before, the monomer, fiber, crystal, crystallite, uh, etc. And I do this at first by hand, by just looking at the images and, and classifying my aggregates. And then I do it with machine learning by just training a very simple neural network to recognize what are the aggregates. And like this, I can actually quantify how many of each aggregates I have for a given affinity and isotropy. And the result is here. Do you use a dense network or like no. artificial or conventional? Uh, uh, yes, dense, dense uh, is like Just five layers, mm -hmm. very, very basic. Oh, sorry, what do you use as a new for the layer of network? Just the, just the picture of final configuration? No, what I use is this matrix. Matrix. Plus the density matrix, which counts how many of each I observe, plus also some stuff that I measure, like the average size of the aggregates, the uh, average porosity of the aggregates, like for example, whether it has holes or not, uh, and then the surface volume ratio of the aggregates. So you could, uh, so the input of this neural network is just your interaction matrix, and it for x and for y is is some. Uh, some global characteristic of no. the obtained of the no, like samples. Like in the probably. input, I have interaction matrix, density matrix, size, uh, porosity, sphericity. And the output is just a number between, like it's eight numbers, that is going to be the probability to be each of those aggregates. Okay. And how do you determine to which type of belongs your picture to eat with the fiber to a and so on, just by eyes? Yes. Uh, how how extensive was the training set? So I have 9,000 uh, different aggregates. I classified 7% of those. Uh, and I have typically a training accuracy that is 99% uh, and a test accuracy that is 98%. How do you classify such a big number of by nines? Uh, 400? I mean, I just automated it and spent some time on my computer. Like, like I'm mean, left in the same you, you, you basically watch it for other yes <laughs> and several times because I mean <laughs> that's really just a case so. uh, <laughs> okay it's super automatized so that that's kind of okay. like a big but the eyes were still yours sorry <laughs> the eyes were still yes, yours I didn't okay. hire some, some <laughs> <exhibition. laughs> yes we just the masters I mean, classifying four hundred images like well, one hour or something like that. Might well, yeah. become like Charlie Chaplin in the uh, times at the end of the day in the factory. It's only once. It's only once. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it, 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 it was not the hardest part. That, so that, um, that is what is doing now the the the, the internet that you are complaining about. Uh, one guy, you know, no, no. So, so the, the number again of, of uh, cases per class was a few hundred or? or uh, yes, yeah, something uh, even less than like 50 or something. Uh -huh. If I have 400 and I have 8. Ah, 400 is the total number yes. of data. No, 400 is the number of data that I classified and 9,000 is the number of total number of data. That you analyzed. That is here, mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Yes. May I ask maybe a silly question? Uh, you have liquid and crystal. Uh, isn't there something in the middle, something like amorphous material? Yes. When you have some shorter and shorter with some yes. several unit cells or something. I classify it as a liquid. As long as, I mean, that's also where lies the maybe limit of that work is that the, the categories that we chose are the one that we chose. Uh, and of course, we're interested in aggregates of small sizes and non-trivial shape and not in like dense packing because many people dealt with dense packing before us. But like, for example, this one here, you clearly see that there's like fibrillar organization within this uh, aggregate, but still I classify it as a liquid because there's no long range organization. Yes. Is there anything that can be learned out of 
What did you yes, want to add? I won't have to ask okay. about it. I think. Okay. Well, what's the difference between that liquid and the crystallite in the second term the left token? Which one, sorry? Crystallite. Take the crystallite top left, second one. Here? Yes, and, and the liquid you just pointed to before. Uh, so what's the big difference? Uh, this one has not uh, size of all the particles in the system. Oh. So, and there, like, there is a clear, like, there is an organized, like, a long range organization of the particles, but I don't have it on the whole system because of those smaller sizes. I mean, I would say that in liquid, you have, let's say, spots that are, uh, let's say, there are spots of various colors here and there. Instead, there they form a, a geometric structure. Yes, like yes. Okay. Yeah. And can the free energy be written for this configuration, or maybe somehow estimated? Because definitely we have some energy of interactions, and also just by ice, various configurations will produce different entropy. So yes, that's. I mean, if you know how to do it, I'm okay. I'm super happy to to hear it about it. But uh, there, it seemed that all these uh, geometric constraints that I talked about before, they they're all in the entropy term and. It's really not trivial how you should write for this complex geometry. Okay, and maybe I can just conclude on something that is okay. I told you there is frustration. Uh, here, what I can do is measure the frustration for all of my systems, but also measure it for a dense organization of the particles. I just run the same simulation and but with the same interaction map, but without space. And I measure the frustration in both cases, and then I compare um, which is the larger for all the categories. And what typically I find is that the frustration is larger in the dense system for the aggregates that are of non, like small sizes or uh, uh, porous aggregates. And this is just a, I mean, this, this is not super surprising, but this is just a way to rationalize the formation of those structures that is, Actually, it's a way like being a less compact aggregate is a way to uh, avoid paying some frustration. You still have to pay some of it because this is not zero, but you decrease the amount of frustration in your aggregates uh, by uh, um, by having a, a diluted, like non completely compact aggregates. So I think I might stop here if uh, it's fine for you. Mm -hmm. It's going to be too long to, okay. to uh, push forward. Good. Let's think. Yeah. We have time for questions. Yes. Maybe just not a question, but the idea which I was having when during your talk, uh, um, maybe it would be interesting to add some pathological particles and to see how this adding these pathological particles, which just differ by this uh, interaction map from other, will break the uh, formation of some uh, some phases. So what do you mean? So you, you just mean add a few particles that, are, that don't have typically the same sets of interactions? Just adding the particles which have different metrics of interaction and see how adding of this particle will break the formation of some yes. regular phase. So actually we did this like Excellent. typically having two types of particles and then but then the parameter space increase even further because you have to have particle A with A, B with B, and A with B. So there's like three interaction matrices that you have to consider. And typically the so of course the results are much different. And in some cases the particles from each types of particles from an aggreg aggregate of their own. And in some cases, they collaborate in forming a, a more stable aggregate that have a mixture of both. But in terms of the shapes of the aggregates, there was no, no, nothing that, it, that was drastically different from what we observed with one single particle. Like typically you have more interactions and but, but there's no like, there's nothing that we missed in terms of the physics of the shape of the aggregates by having only one particle. But then of course, in, that's, I mean, that's the whole question of that project is, do you want to tackle very specific systems or do you want to be generic? So far, I only introduced you with the generic part. We also had some this very specific study on systems that looked interesting to us. But in, I mean, if you have the generic point of view, then I would say 
from what we saw, there's no clear difference. Like there's no clear um, uh, advantage to having another type of particle. But of course, in some specific example, it could make a difference. Maybe just the action of omega-3 uh, fatty acids can be one of the yeah. ingredients. Sorry? Oh. oh, okay, we can discuss. Okay, okay. okay. And, and then maybe just a comment. So we tried with two, we could try with more. I mean, it's, it's possible to implement it, but then the more you... Uh, so there's a whole branch of people that do self-assembly where they have particles that are all different and they look for... They uh, tune their interactions so that they're going to be there, such that they're going to give them one specific shape. And that's not the question we want to ask. I mean, there's a whole community of people that are tackling these questions, questions of kinetics, then, because if you have all particles that have different interactions, how are you sure that you're going to form the aggregate that you expect? But that's not the like uh, protein inspired types of question that we ask, but it's also possible. Uh, this is 2D, right? Yes. The world is 3D. So uh, I mean, we can do it, but it's already hard enough to, to deal with it. Do you have any idea of how everything can yes. suddenly be scrambled up and change if we go to 3D? From 2D uh, so, to uh, typically, uh, the, there is an extra type of shape that are going to emerge is the sheet, because it's like two-dimensional aggregate in three dimensions. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's going to change a lot the, the, the concept. Uh, like we, so there was another guy before in my group that had simulations with like much more simple particles, but in 3D, and typically he will observe crystals, sheets, fibers, and mice. I was just wondering whether maybe I can avoid uh, frustration if I have uh, another degree of freedom, so I can just go yes. around. And... Uh, then you have to maybe tell, compare the proportions of each. Like proportions of uh, of aggregates of small size, like small sizes, like or like fiber and uh, and uh, and micelles and crystallites. Uh, it's I mean it it also depends a lot on the particle geometry. Sure. It it will, I mean the result would be I, my answering would be the results are going to be quantitatively different but qualitatively similar, and we have not very clear predict prediction of, okay, I, I can't tell you, with this system, there's going to be 10% of fibers and that's it. I, I mean, there's no such strong claim that I'm making. And so here it's like 5% maybe. And if I take square, it's going to be six. And if I take cube, it's going to be nine or one. I don't know, but. You promised me before an answer about uh, the square, but I didn't get it. Or ah, I, yes. what I failed to, to, to grab. Yes. It's here. Uh, here, you only need three particles to be in a frustrated configuration. I see. Okay, so you cannot have frustration. I mean, there's frustration arises more easily with the hexagons. Than okay. Yes. Whether the there were things you did talk about because you didn't have time. Uh, are there any like important uh, final results which would add to the picture which you um, uh, which you didn't discuss uh, or? Do we kind of have a, an overall picture? You have an overall picture of the first project. Well, then is the second one oh, no, making a different picture? Yes. What is it? Tell us in two sentences. Next week. Uh, <laughs> so, so here it's like a general picture of understanding the, the self-assembly. The, the, uh, okay. Sorry. Okay. Okay, uh, the other question is, can you engineer an aggregate that has very specific properties just by changing the local interactions? So it's, well, I'm gonna use the same model. This is what, or less I was asking, right? If you can extract some, some guiding principles from yes, the maybe. machine learning result. Uh, uh, so, okay, no, here I'm not gonna use okay. machine learning. But uh, the thing is, I, I now I want, I'm, I'm an engineer, I, I'm super happy because I have self-assembly such that Everything is going to come together. I don't need to act on it. And can I design something? And interestingly, can I design something that has a finite size and a controlled size? Because of course, if you have attractive interactions, the more you add particle, the bigger is going to be the aggregate. But then uh, a cool feature is to be able to control the size of your aggregate. And we came up with a, so this is uh, the literature, so maybe I'm going to skip it. But we came up with 
a specific design that would enable to have aggregates of controlled size. Uh, so typically here, just there's, behind there's an interaction map again, but here the particle is such that either they align with their neighbors and they form a crystal, or they form this uh, um, twisted um, uh, interaction. And the result of the aggregate is that one. So typically you have the two interactions, the crystalline interaction and the line interaction that I, I call that I color in blue. And uh, so you have an aggregate of size R. Yes, so this is called, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the circle. Maybe we're not gonna keep it in the paper in the end. But, but it's, it's, yeah, what? You are obliging the collaboration? Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> so. How will you go? No, but pizza is flat. This thing ah, is flat. Yeah, but it's the, it's the 2D job. But so it's still pizza, it's more about it's pizza, right? There. Yeah, <laughs> pizza is more about yes. You should change. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, okay, and so the point here is that because of uh, if I have the blue line, the dark blue that is more favored, I want to have plenty of these disclination lines, but I can't have more than those six in a dense packing. And so in a way, it's also some frustration. I have those two favored interaction and, I, and they're competing. And because the two don't have the same scaling in R, like this one scales like the area and this one scales, scales like the, the line, you can be the such configuration that this is gonna be more stable than that. And then, okay, we confirm it with, uh, so that's the phase diagram and we confirmed it with the numerical simulation. And basically here, are the interesting cases where you have aggregates of finite size and you can predict the size by just controlling the relative strength of two interactions. So that was a maybe much a chill, cool example of, uh, of this model. Thank you. More questions? Yes. Yeah, yeah questions. One is I wonder if the theoretical description of the state can map uh, this part of the spin model and the box model. Of that. Yes, uh, so there is this reason that uh, here the faces are interacting and not the orientations. And so if you have those yeah, right. orientations together and those, yeah. Yeah, that's the. Uh, yeah, and yeah. Um, simply I'm wondering, I mean, in principle, what is wrong with that? So if you want to understand like which interactions if you give an aggregate. Yes. Yeah, I will literally start to draw the aggregate and then try to see which Well, that's it. easy when you have the very simplistic interaction maps that I showed you at the beginning. But if you have the one where everything is continuous scale and you have plenty mm -hmm. of robust and attractive, then mm -hmm. I mean, I give you the metrics and I, I bet you can't tell what's the shape, like what's sure. the most stable state without the simulations. More questions? We have one more. So uh, water, we, we talked about water already here. Water is, is also it has these you know these polar molecules, which actually up uh, up to a nanosecond uh, forms quite some complex uh, networks. Mm -hmm. And uh, can one consider this also, or is there discussions to look at this that, that water molecules also uh, doing some uh, kind of self organization mm -hmm. and, and what are the patterns there? I mean that's kind of like a very simple. Yes. Uh, um, but that's how I started to think about 3D. Okay. Going back to this. Thing. So this is really not, I mean, what is, this is really not something that we thought about. Uh, and maybe the reason is that you, oh, oh yes, I, let me think of a good reason why we think about this. It's not that you have to think about yeah, yeah. it. I was just wondering whether this is also discussed in this context. So uh, I would say that there are probably models that are much more adapted to dealing with uh, understanding what? water. Absolutely. Um, and that maybe you could, but, and also, I, I mean, all of this is on the lattice. So I'm not sure it's going to it be very adapted. So the fact that we're on the lattice constrains, constrains a lot the geometry of the particles as that would title, like we, we can only deal with very simple geometries and that's by paying this because that we're able to consider very complex interactions. So I would say it's just not super well adapted uh, to, to deal with this question. But I don't buy the lattice argument because I mean, and then you just got the entire research and say it's on the lattice, but the world isn't the lattice, so that's it. So if you think this is relevant, then you could do the same with water. Yes. I was just asking, you know, we have again they can form some bonds and then they form some kind of 
uh, their network. And that's what they do up to a nano segment. Yes. Water is not actually a nice liquid, but some kind of dangerous thing, which is always uh, ripping off its. Uh, okay, so yeah, maybe that's a room or a big body temperature. Yeah, no. Close. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So I have some more questions. Zoomers. That still sounds almost like this. Okay. There, yes, one last question. Is there a notion of the environment? What's the like environment? Like the weak environment the particles are uh, so that's not that's not something we consider at all. And the claim is if you change the environment, you can just change the interaction map. Like okay, if you have in, you are in the oral, like it's like changing the temperature amounts to changing the interaction map with stronger or uh, uh, less strong interactions. So I would say. If uh, with probably with smart tricks, if you change something in the environment, you can just change the interaction. Okay, first triple question, last one. Okay. Thank you. So finally, what was the size of the system? Uh, and uh, to obtain uh, some uh, fractal like things. Um, okay, so what was the size of the system? It's uh, 30 times 30 sites uh, and 100 particles. So the density is one of the nine. Uh, and fractal, we what 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 the closest we had from fractal was. Yes. Okay. The closest we had to fractal, I'm not sure why that's what you're referring to. It would be those branching fibers. Uh, so typically, it's fiber like they the most favored is they want to align, but then. The network is a bit packed, and this uh, corner interaction is not that bad. So okay, let's let's have this kind of network of fibers. Uh, if that's what you're referring to, that's I think that's the closest we had. And then there, there is also those like super porous aggregates. I mean, this is not a fractal probably, but uh, this is you can fit both as a crystal with very big holes or as a network of fibrillar structures. I don't know if it's answering your question. Okay, let's uh, uh, thank Laura again. Thank you.